of the work that I've been looking into as far as the Fourth Amendment, which is relevant and why you're all here. So, how many of y'all actually heard about the New York Times piece yesterday about how the U.S. Postal Service is actually scanning all of our postal mail also? All right. Actually, it doesn't look like that many folks have heard about that. So, apparently last month it came out in an FBI case in court that some of the evidence that was used um, came from a postal service program that's secret. It's called the Mail um, Intake and Control and Tracking System, MICT. And apparently what this is, is the U.S. Postal Service in the process of processing our actual snail mail, takes a photograph of the front and the back of every piece of mail that's processed in the United States. Last year, that was 160 billion pieces of mail. So, that's interesting, right? You're, you've got a giant database, and apparently this database goes back to, you guessed it, 2001. <laughs> And it's a database that has every single mail transaction in the country, all of us. And so that's, that actually dates back, like there's a, there's a similar actual process that law enforcement uses called mail covers, which is a legal process whereby you can actually, uh, the law enforcement officer can say, we need to actually track this particular person's email, or sorry, snail mail, and we need to do that for 30 days, maybe an extension to 120 days. And there's a case called the United States versus Choke, 1978, which says that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy on your snail mail because it's there for everyone to see, right? It's the information you have on the outside of that document. The Postal Service worker needs to be able to read it to be able to see it. So there's a case law going back that says that mail covers this limited, targeted, specific uh, in law enforcement tool is legal. So, but what we have now, which is different, is that you have mail covers with no limitation of time and with no specificity about who it's targeting. It's targeting every single one of us. And so this was used in this case last June to determine someone who was sending the, the rice and poison in the mail in these unmarked letters and the way they figured it out was that they were able to go back into this MICT system and they were to say, well don't look at that mail, look at the mail around it that was processed at that particular location and you can see, well it was picked up by one postal service worker and it was, you got the, the return addresses of everyone right around that piece of email. And that's how they were able to isolate that person and use that system to stop someone who was sitting poison in the mail. That's great. That's great. But there's all this other information that's out there. And apparently it doesn't take a warrant. It doesn't even take a subpoena. It takes filling out a form to get all of your mail transactions back to 2001. So that's problematic, right? Because there's no judicial oversight. So. This is interesting because that's like letter snail mail metadata, right? You've heard this term metadata. It's this stuff that's on the outside of the envelope. No big deal, right? Don't have to be worried. So let's tie this back to the Fourth Amendment. And this is the one thing I wrote down or printed out, which is the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Let's give a hand for the Fourth Amendment. So what we've seen with the release of this 
Verizon targeting court order by Edward Snowden, which Edward Snowden, let's give that guy a hand too. We need more people like Mr. Snowden in Mr. Snowden's position to feel comfortable coming forward and voicing their conscience. We need more people who have top secret clearance, which is on the order of 1.4 million, I believe, people have top secret clearance. You know, among that 1.4 million people, there's probably a few who actually don't agree with what's going on. And I encourage them to step forward, and we need to make it safe for those people to step forward as well. So the parts that I want to focus on here, because the letter metadata is the exact same thing as your telephone metadata. It's the exact same sort of process that's being implemented under the cover of what? I'm not really sure. We need to find out like what is that U.S. Postal Service order um, that legitimates that, or not legitimates it, but lets the postal inspector move forward with that. So. The part that these things have in common is that they're general search warrants. And general search warrants are not legal according to the Constitution. And a general search warrant has an interesting history which we can get into here. But let's first focus on the particularity question. So in the Fourth Amendment it says it has to particularly describe the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Now, if I'm telling Verizon that I want the metadata on everyone, and if I'm telling the Postal Service that I want the letter metadata on everyone, that's not really very particular, is it? That's a general search warrant. So, the general search warrant, the reason why those are not legal dates back to before the American Revolution. And in fact, it was one of the primary reasons why the American Revolution took place, from what I understand. Yeah. So, I did some reading last night on the internet, which is pretty awesome. Y'all should check this out. Like, it's a really wonderful thing that we have access to. It's a wonderful thing that we have created, and it's a wonderful thing that's being attempted to be co-opted and made an unsafe place, which is unfortunate. So, but according to the interwebs, there was a thing called writs of assistance, which the British government issued, um, in some sense it seems, to combat smuggling operations which were um, active in the colonies at the time. And so these writs of assistance were issued to customs officers, which required then any law enforcement officials that they reached out to to assist them in the process of looking for contraband or basically doing whatever they wanted because these general search warrants were not particular they just basically said you have to assist this person you cannot actually resist in some sense and it didn't have to describe what they were looking for they could actually even be transferred from one person that they were issued to to another without any sort of judicial oversight. And so this really actually started rubbing colonists wrong, especially around Boston, actually, where these writs were being abused by British officials to break into people's houses. Not even break into people's houses, just demand that they enter and not have to say what they were searching for. So there was a case that was brought forward about this in 1761 that was argued by an influential person called James Otis. If, uh, if you look up James Otis, you'll see some of the things that he's written about at that time. And so he was arguing that these general search warrants were despicable. They were being abused by officials in power and that there was nothing that the colonists could do to resist them. One of, the, one of the quotes that was really compelling was that it puts the safety of our liberty in the hands of the petty servants. So I love Mr. Edward Snowden, but the fact is, is that he was a contractor for a defense contracting agency and he had access to all of this information. Now, what if you were actually a malicious actor? 
amongst that 1.4 million people that have access to all of this information. That, that bothers me. That bothers me thinking that I have no visibility into this. I have no recourse. This information has been stored since 2001 at least, going back before then if you actually know more about the history of the NSA. 96. So, and the thing that's problematic is that, I don't know about you, but I feel like the trajectory of our governing process, the, the leaders that we are left with, in some sense, the choice between lesser of two evils and such, that doesn't give me a lot of confidence as far as the trajectory of having access to this amount of information. And so people say, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have anything to hide, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a good person. Well, it's not just about you. The reason why this metadata is so interesting is that it shows your entire social graph. It shows everyone that you're connected with. And it's those connections which are the part that is uh, processed by these unfeeling and unthinking algorithms that try to make some conclusions based upon partial information, often wrong information, that you have no recourse to see, to correct, to have any influence on whatsoever. And it's not just the government, as Mr. Crow was pointing out. Private sector is doing this too. Facebook is probably among the worst. I wanted to let you know about one thing while we're in that area. Look up Facebook, download your information. There's a tool that you can actually use to download everything that Facebook is willing to share with you that they have, that you've put into the system. It will astound you if you have used Facebook for any period of time. Be sure also to look at the section on the marketing terms that are associated with your identity. That's really interesting. So in this sense, I feel like we have to stand up. We have to say that, all right, this is too much. Why are we even doing this anymore? It's not making us more safe. It's endangering all of us. And we have to do something about it. So I don't know if anyone's mentioned it yet, but I understand that the people who have organized this event are organizing another event on the 14th. Uh, it's taking the form of what's called a crypto party. And this is a way for the people who understand these tools that you can use to protect yourself online, that they will actually share that information with you. So come to their event, stay tapped into Restore the Fourth on Facebook, unfortunately. And uh, just keep track of all of this. Support the people that are doing this sort of work. And I wish I had more that I could tell you as far as what you can do. Um, Please come talk to me. And, uh, but for right now, I'm happy. I think we're going to do a, uh, a Q&A session or something along those lines after this. And so I would love to answer any sort of questions. I'm not, I don't like this broadcasting top-down. I'm more of a peer-to-peer -peer guy myself. So.